I work for the uh, city's department, city of Chicago's Department of Housing. Let's see if I can work this clicker. There we go. All right. So why don't we sort of jump right into it um, so I can talk about what it's like to actually administer a, an inclusionary zoning uh, program. Our, um, what we call our ARO, Affordable Requirements Ordinance, really started in about 2003. We did some major overhauls of that ordinance uh, in 2007 and then um, Actually, rather recently, we did a huge overhaul of um, our affordable requirements ordinance in 2015, and we are now looking at probably doing yet another overhaul. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how our uh, ordinance works. As you know, some of your speakers indicated, there are lots of different ways to set up your um, inclusionary zoning. Uh, so this is how we, we set ours up. Um, again, talking about the goals, right, was to create affordable, more affordable units, primarily leveraging um, strong markets. Um, and we wanted to generate um, additional funding for affordable housing, for building and developing affordable housing through in-lieu fee payments. And those in-lieu fee payments go into what's called the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, what we call AHOF. Um, so, um, to trigger um, our uh, affordable requirements ordinance, our ARO requirements, it applies to any residential development um, that gets some sort of a public benefit. So that's uh, city land, some uh, financial uh, assistance, city financial assistance, uh, or um, the most prevalent trigger for affordable, the uh, ARO, is uh, some sort of a zoning change which allows you to increase, uh, increase your density. Um, it applies to any residential projects of 10 units or more. Those would be new units. Um, so it wouldn't apply if you were reno renovating existing units. Uh, you have to be producing 10 or more new units. And you're getting a zoning change. You're getting city land. Or um, it also applies to downtown plan developments, uh, which tend to obviously be uh, much larger projects. Um, and then if you're getting... Um, city financial assistance, including TIF, um, the uh, affordability requirement goes from 10% of your units to 20% of your units if you're getting direct city financial assistance. So in 2007, so every five years we do uh, a five-year housing plan. We actually have a huge convening of people across uh, the housing uh, sector um, Ellen was involved in coordinating one of our five-year housing plans, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, as part of that, uh, the two in 2007, um, um, retooling of our ARO rose out of this convening of stakeholders that said we need to do something new with our, our affordable requirements ordinance. Uh, so in 2007, we required 10% of the units to be affordable, which, had, which was an increase, and we also adjusted uh, the in-lieu fee to $100,000 per unit. Um, and our affordable requirements ordinance applies citywide. Uh, there are some jurisdictions where um, your IZ uh, only applies in certain specific geographic areas. Ours applies citywide. Um, and so then in 2014, we were, of course, dealing with a very – changing housing market, um, coming from a housing crash and to um, um, uh, a, uh, um, um, the housing market was getting uh, better. And so we uh, convened a task force and uh, decided to um, retool our uh, affordable requirements ordinance again. Uh, the goal was to create more units, but it was also to understand that because we had a citywide ordinance, we understood that there were different markets in the city, and so we needed to make some adjustments for the fact that we had different markets. So what we did was we created three zones um, based upon uh, economic um, factors. So we, of course, had our downtown zone, we had higher income areas, and then we had low moderate areas. And so the requirements under the ARO are different for the different areas. So here's just a map that shows you, obviously, the green is our downtown. Uh, basically D, D zones um, from a, um, uh, and then um, we've got our low mod areas and then our higher income areas. 
Uh, it, we also adjusted our in-lieu fees, and the in-lieu fees were adjusted based upon the kind of market that the development was in. Um, so um, in our low mod markets, we actually brought the fee down. Now that a free fee is adjusted annually by the CPI. Um, so currently it's at about 52000 now. Um, higher income areas, we increased the fee, and then in our downtown uh, districts, uh, we increased the fee, 175000 uh, for rental and two hundred. Excuse me, two hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, for four sale units. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that we have found um, is that um, she, she mentioned um, the CPAN uh, program. So the CPAN program, uh, new uh, four sale units um, are actually put in our. Um, Chicago Community Land Trust, and so that's how we secure the long-term affordability for those. We actually have a land trust that puts deed restrictions uh, on those units and keeps them affordable for the, long, for the long run. But what we found is that the vast majority of units that are created under our um, ARO are rental units. Uh, we have much more robust rental market uh, in Chicago over the last few decades than uh, a home ownership market, certainly in our, our strong neighborhoods. Um, what we are finding also, so I was thinking about some of the comments from, from our previous speakers, one of the things that we're finding is that we don't necessarily see uh, the cost of land reflecting um, the ARO requirements. Um, land, is, it just costs what it costs in these strong markets, and we're not seeing that reflected in the sale price of, of land. Uh, some of that, I think, has to do with the fact that we actually have a very robust market in Chicago. Um, Chicago is still very affordable when it comes to land costs and development costs as compared to other large cities like San Francisco, New York. Um, and so the market is still very, very strong. And essentially what we're seeing is we're seeing developers are simply absorbing that um, because the, the rents that they can get, because remember this is mostly rental projects, the rents that they can get are so high that they can really absorb the cost. There's no subsidy that's necessary, even though we do have, the, I mean, a lot of them are taking advantage of our density bonuses and our transit serve location bonuses that allow them to get more density. Um, so they're getting more units and more net operating income. And so um, they're able to absorb that into that into that larger benefit. So we're not seeing it sort of passed on. We're not seeing a demand for us to provide any sort of incentives or subsidies beyond that. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that there was a mention about the fact that in some markets, and this is true, um, if you have inclusionary zoning and sort of your neighboring jurisdictions don't have it, they, some developers could make the choice to say, well, I'll just develop someplace else. That has to be mitigated, however, by how strong the market is in your neighboring jurisdictions, right? Um, and the market in, you know, people want to live in Chicago uh, right now. Uh, so there's not really that kind of a choice for a developer who wants to develop high-end rental, you know, 300 units high-end rental. There's no place else that you're going to build that around, around there, right? You're gonna ha you have to build in Chicago. Um, and so that gives us a little more leverage. Um, so uh, we also, for the first time, when we redid the uh, 2015 ARO, allowed offsite units. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the offsite units. Um, developers in higher income areas and uh, downtown have to, had the option to build their offsite units within two miles of the development and within the same income zone. So if you're building your development in a higher income zone, uh, your offsite units had to be within the higher income zone. Uh, and within two miles of, of your project. Same thing for downtown. Um, now, downtown for sale, uh, the rule was ch changed so that you could build it anywhere in the city. But what, we're, of course, what we were finding was there just isn't a lot of for sale development in our downtown D districts. Um, the offsite units needed to be comparable um, in size and quality, um, and they had to be constructed sort of at the same rate um, you can't um, sort of build your triggering project and then say, we'll, we'll get to the affordable ones later. Uh, you sort of have to build them all at the same rate. Um, and 
So one of the things that we found in Chicago was that we had significant issues with um, uh, gentrification. We had neighborhoods where existing um, renters and existing homeowners were really just getting priced out of the market, um, and there was um, there was some push to to figure out how to how to resolve this issue. So one of the things we did was we uh, created a couple of pilots under our um, inclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, here we go. So the pilots were to respond directly to um, these affordability concerns. Most of these came out of planning processes in the targeted neighborhoods where this loss of affordable housing became a key issue um, and um, the high concentration of high-end development was, was occurring. The goal was to uh, get more units created and stop gentrification in these hot markets. Um, so what the pilots did, in each of the pilots, uh, we raised the affordability requirement from about 10% to about 20%, 15 or 20%, depending on um, certain, certain conditions. We actually eliminated the in lieu fee option. So the affordable units had to be created. Um, and um, a couple other, we put some special programs in for existing residents to, to help existing residents. One of the things we found, however, is that we obviously instituted the pilots in the areas that had um, um, the highest level of, of developer interest and, and development. They were producing the most units in the city, which is why, you know, gentrification was becoming an issue. Uh, they also generate the highest percentage of our in lieu fees. So as the pilots have come underway, we have actually found that our in lieu fee collections are being reduced. Our in lieu fee collections support both our low income housing trust fund, which provides subsidies to uh, our lowest income renters uh, in Chicago, and then the other half goes to support um, um, affordable housing development. We'll talk about that a little bit. But so that's one of the adjuncts of these, these pilots. These pilots are actually very effective. Um, so just overall, right, measuring success. Um, so we've produced, now this would be since uh, 2015, we've produced, uh, no, I'm sorry, it would be since 2007. We've produced about 800 uh, affordable housing units and collected about $94 million um, in in lieu fees. Um, and then these are some of our pilots. These pilots uh, were introduced uh, to 2017. Um, and they've uh, produced um, about uh, 175 or so ARO units, about 170 ARO units. And this is our Affordable Hop Housing Opportunity Fund. Uh, these are in lieu fee collections. So from about 2007 to 2015, we collected about $65 million in in lieu fees. From 2015 to uh, the end of last year, uh, we collected about $93 million. Um, overall, um, about 87 million uh, of that went to uh, the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, and I'll show you how that's broken down in a minute. And then the rest went to uh, our Low Income Housing Trust Fund. It is uh, probably the main funder of our Low Income Housing Trust Fund, which gets a little money also from the state. But interestingly enough, one of the things that we did was we decided to use some of our in lieu fees not directly just for funding our multifamily development, um, which is it's good, I mean, because we pair it with uh, other funding sources when we're doing our multifamily development. It comes out to um, a, um, an investment of about $200,000 a unit uh, when, uh, in our in lieu fees. Um, however, we also are funding some very interesting and innovative programs uh, with our in lieu fees as well. So we have an opportunity investment fund. We work with uh, uh, a CDFI partner and banks uh, to create a fund that provides um, low cost uh, uh, lending capital for private developers that are purchasing existing market rate developments in very, very high income areas. And in exchange, we get uh, some affordable units, about 20% of their units affordable uh, for about 15 years. Uh, same thing with our Preserving Affordable Rental uh, Program. That's a newer program, and essentially what we do is we use our funding to um, refinance private debt. Uh, very, very low interest rates, uh, very, very uh, favorable terms, and we get some affordable, some affordable units in return. 
Um, so there's just a number of uh, some neighborhood-based programs, some um, purchase price assistance programs. Our flexible housing subsidy pool provides um, uh, rental subsidies uh, for people that are coming out of homelessness. Um, so we've been able to uh, leverage the in-lieu fees, which are very, very important, um, to support some of our, some of our programs. Um, so again, measuring success, we talked about, the, uh, our speaker talked about the fact that um, sort of measuring what you do, where are your units, how much do they cost, uh, how do they compare to the market rate units. So you have some idea not only of whether your program is working, but sort of where, where are your units being produced. Um, so this is just sort of a map. Um, the, the, the green dots actually are units that are supported by our Low Income Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and then the red dots are units that were produced on site in the actual um, developments themselves. Um, there's a couple yellow dots that you see here, which are uh, the off-site units and some units that we uh, uh, developed ourselves. Uh, but as you can see, I mean, it's, it's especially if you count the low-income housing trust fund units, they're spread all over the place. But as you see, right, inclusionary zoning is supposed to leverage um, hot markets, right? Uh, and pr produce affordable units in those markets. Um, it's a tool to help uh, reverse patterns of segregation. And as you can see from the red, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. The green, however, um, shows that sort of our patterns of leveraging the in lieu fees that we get um, tend to follow the same pattern of where do, we, where, do we, where do we have to spend our money? We have to spend our money in the neighborhoods that lack investment otherwise, right? So that's primarily where our in-loop fees are going. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we're able to do is because, um, again, Chicago has a very strong market. We have a number of really, really big developments that are going on. Obviously, not just Chicago, Atlanta, and some other places have what we call these mega developments that are happening. But we've been able to use the plan development process, the PD process, um, that's where we have some flexibility, where we can essentially negotiate the uh, affordability requirements um, in these. And so we've been able to negotiate some pretty robust and innovative uh, leveraging of these large developments um, to produce uh, really robust, affordable numbers of affordable housing units, our Lincoln Yards development, some of you, because it was in the news a lot, some of you may have heard of this development. It's about a $6 billion, 10-year term investment in an old rail yard um, that uh, uh, is being uh, developed in Chicago. We were able to get about 600 on-site units. 25% uh, of the units will be off-site, and we got a guaranteed um, $39 million uh, in-lieu fee payment, assuming full build-out. Um, we've been able to leverage a couple other ones. The 78 is an interesting one. We actually uh, were able to work out with Related Midwest, uh, not only a guaranteed in lieu fee payment based upon percentages at full build out, but we're able to negotiate with them an actual upfront payment of about $10 million. Gave them a discount over time, obviously, because these in lieu fees would come in over time. You've got a CPI increase. Uh, so we're able to do some net present value calculations, and uh, but that $10 million is going to really help our low-income housing trust fund and some other stuff like right now. Um, anyway, so we're able to do some really interesting stuff, but you guys are probably more interested in how we do this thing on the ground, right? How do we, how do we monitor and administer this thing? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, just lessons learned, and uh, she's right, staffing, we had three, and now I've got two people <laughs> running this program for the third largest jurisdiction in the country. Uh, but they do an excellent, they do a fantastic job. <laughs> they do a fantastic job. Uh, and we are in the process of sort of um, um, upgrading our, our um, technology base so that, that, so that we can monitor these more. Uh, but just let me walk you through sort of the process a little bit, right? So you're a developer, um, and you're going to do a project. You know that project is going to be subject to the ARO. So you contact my staff, and you actually fill out a, a form that gives us a bunch of information about the project. You can do it online, and you submit it to us. Uh, we then sit down with you and talk you through, well, here's the stuff that you have to do. 
Um, you can go on and apply for your building permits, but your building permits actually have a hold on them, and you cannot get your building permits until you have negotiated with us what your what your ARO requirements are, and have signed a, a covenant with us, which is recorded against your project. And then, if you're doing offsite units, then it's also recorded against the offsite units. So you have to actually secure the land or the building where you're going to do your offsite units, so that we can record our covenants before you can get your permits, including your, your, uh, your foundation underground permits, too. Um, and uh, once that is done, um, then you build your units. Your affordable units have to be delivered at the time of or before uh, your market rate triggering units, whether they're on-site or, or off-site. Um, and then uh, your in-lieu fee payment has to be paid uh, before your permit issues too, which sometimes creates some issues because their in lieu fee payments are coming out of close of financing. So, but we've been able to sort of work that out. Um, so, what have we found? Let's see. Probably clearly articulate the policy goals. Um, it's gonna. It, it needs to be very clear exactly what the goal of your inclusionary zoning is, so that. All of your stakeholders understand what that is. Um, one of the things that we found in Chicago is that um, inclusionary zoning is very visible because it usually involves um, your larger scale developments. Um, and uh, it's, at least in Chicago, it also has to, tends to be related to issues of, of segregation and inclusion and other stuff. So it's, it's very visible and people often want it to do a lot of things that it's not necessarily designed to do. So you should be very clear uh, with all of the stakeholders involved, what's the goal of your inclusionary zoning policy and what can it achieve and what is it not designed and what is it design, not designed to achieve? That needs to be very clear, I think, because um, it just cannot be all things. So in Chicago, one of the things we find is that um, there's a concern about there's not enough family size units being developed because the units that you develop under our inclusionary zoning policy have to be comparable with the units that the market is creating. Well, the market is creating studios ones and twos, right? Um, we have a large need for three and four bedroom, three and four bedroom units. So there's a push to make our inclusionary zoning policies create more family um, units. Um, our Inclusionary zoning essentially creates workforce housing. As you, as you heard, just like most of the other jurisdictions, our income restrictions are somewhere between 80 and 120 percent area median income, depending on whether you're talking about rental or, uh, or home ownership. Um, we don't have 30 percent AMI requirements, right? That's not what this was designed to do. And generally, the numbers, it begins to be difficult for the numbers to work. So if you're doing a large-scale rental development and you want them to produce a certain number of 30% AMI units, you have two issues there. One is that most of the time, these are not affordable housing developers, so they have no idea how to deal with our monitoring and compliance when it comes to um, making sure that they're renting to the right income levels over a 30-year period, because our restrictions are 30 years, right? They, they, they don't know how to do that. So... Um, it becomes difficult, the, the lower the percentage, and it just becomes difficult for the developers to make the numbers work, and then they're looking to you. Well, now I need some incentives. And, you know, really the goal of, at least for in Chicago, our goal is for th this program to produce units without us paying for them, right? We're not trying to give the developers anything. Once you got your zoning change, you're allowed to increase your density. Don't ask us for any money, right? The whole point of this is to leverage the private market to produce these units without us paying for it. Um, even if they want to produce units on, say, city-owned land, we'll give you the city-owned land, but we're going to give it to you at market rate. Again, because your money is supposed to produce these units, not ours. Um, so it's got to work economically for the developer to do that, or else you've got to put some incentives in for them. Um, we ha also have some issues of local preference. And gentrification and displacement is a, it's a real uh, critical issue in Chicago right now. Um, but as you know, once you start to try and build in local preferences, you can bump up against fair housing laws. Um, so we're trying to figure some of that out. Um, where we've landed so far is just doing some targeted marketing of existing residents in, in certain neighborhoods to, so that we know that they have the ability to access the units, but we haven't figured out a way under fair housing laws to, to give them preference for those units yet. So that's an ongoing issue for us. 
Um, the other thing is, and this gets back to what's the purpose of the ARO, at least in Chicago, what we found is that there's so much focus on the ARO, it sometimes gets lost. So um, since 2009, right, we've spent about $3.2 billion in Chicago, spent and leveraged, uh, and created about 80,000 units. During that same period of time, our inclusionary zoning created just under 900 units. So you understand that it's not even our main tool for the creation and preservation of affordable housing. It just seems to be the sexiest, right? This is what people, this is what people focus on. And sometimes you have, to, you have to work hard to remind people that if there's a need for, say, 30% AMI units and their family size units, the ARO may not be the tool that we need to create those units. We may need a different tool. Um, and so just sort of negotiating with your stakeholders and sort of making sure that everybody's uh, on the right page, on the same page when it comes to what, what your goals and what your expectations are uh, for your, 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 affordable, your inclusionary zoning policy. Excuse me. Um, so in lieu fees, so this is something that we are, again, we're sort of looking at making some, some more changes to our ARO. As a lot of you know, we have a new administration coming in Chicago. Um, and so this is a chance for us to really take a fresh look at a bunch of, at, at some stuff, including our inclusionary zoning policy. So we'll be looking at some of this stuff. So I'm sort of actually talking through some of our thinking with you right now. Um, so we, we set in lieu fees, and in lieu fees were, were, the amount of in lieu fees were really set in a consensus with everybody, but there really was no real science to it. I'm, I'm talking amongst practitioners here, right? This doesn't go beyond the room. There really was no, no science to it, right? Uh, and we've begun to see, I think, but, but you have to, those in lieu fees have to be balanced very carefully, right? Um, col the collection of in lieu fees, you want there to be some incentive for uh, part of the obligation to be um, fulfilled through the, through the payment of in lieu fees because those in lieu fees are important. You can use them for, for stuff, right? On the other hand, you don't want the in lieu fees set so low that the incentive is really for nobody to build anything and for them just to pay the fee. Because paying of the fee is obviously easier, right? You, you don't have to worry about building units and all of this stuff. So there's, there's, there's a balancing. Um, but what we're seeing is we think that the in lieu fees probably should be set a little closer to the actual, how much it actually costs to produce a unit um, so that other factors besides just the amount of the in lieu fee uh, factor into when the units are built and when the fees are paid. And what we find is that um, that actually helps to produce the units where you need them. Um, let me see what else. And just a characterization of the in lieu fee. This is uh, something that uh, I don't, maybe it's particular to Chicago, but the in lieu fee um, is often described as um, developers opting out. Uh, and it's sometimes it's difficult to explain to people that um, the way our inclusionary zoning ordinance is set up, um, the affordability obligation sort of has three different ways that you can fulfill that obligation. You can pay some fees, you can build units on site, or you can build units off site. And they all sort of produce affordable units in one fashion or another. Um, but people often see the paying of the in lieu fee as developers sort of getting out of their obligation. So being able to, to message that, I think, is also uh, very important. Uh, I just want to, I know, my time is up, my time is up. Okay, I just wanted to go back to one other point, though. One of the things that we found in, in administering this is that the on-site units, the off-site units, I'm sorry, are very difficult to manage. Um, just quality location, timing, um, they're very, very difficult to manage. They can be very important to have that as an option, uh, but you really need to think through your process of managing those because, right, developers, God bless them, um, you know, if it wasn't for developers, we wouldn't have the affordable units, and they're trying to make sure that, that the numbers make sense to them, but what we find is that a lot of developers are trying to give us units that just are not quality units um, to save themselves a little bit of money. So just managing that process, inspections, and going back and forth with plans, and uh, it's just it's a nightmare. Um, so just managing that process, I think, is something that, that you want to keep in mind when it comes to offsite units. So there you go. Sorry, I could talk about this all day.